How do we celebrate Christmas? Indeed, that is a great question. How do we celebrate Christmas? What is it that goes on in our, in our culture? I want you to take a, pencil, a pen or a pencil and right there above your outline, just put a few words up there above the title perhaps that come to your mind. What are some things that people do as they're celebrating Christmas? What are traditions? Just, just, I mean, word association here, Christmas, and you think of what? What are things that people do? How do they celebrate Christmas? Um, just start, just write down a few of them, write down two or three of them first, and um, what is it that people do as they celebrate Christmas in our culture? Uh, somebody offer me one. What, what do we do? Okay, somebody said decorating. That's exactly right. We decorate differently. Our house is different. As part of decoration, what do we do? We use evergreen trees. It's a, kind of a beautiful thing. We put lights on evergreen trees. You know, I never understood how they did candles on evergreen trees in Germany without burning the country down um, when they first started that. I mean, most of the live trees that we ever had by Christmas time, they were a true fire hazard. So I uh, don't understand that. But, you know, we, we put candles on trees representing light and uh, the evergreen nature, the perennial uh, truth of life in that. What are some other things? Somebody said feasting. Did I hear that? Yep, we eat. What else do we do? Okay, we give gifts. That's right. We do that. Um, we do a lot of music. Um, we've just been, we've just been saying, singing and music. I, I heard Miss Manette back here say, uh, we come and we worship together. Um, those, are, those are very, very good things. But you know, it's interesting, and I, and I, I want us to really think about how we celebrate Christmas. And I want us to think about how we're going to celebrate this Christmas. And what is it that we do versus what is it that we should do? Um, in fact, there's a lot of people with a lot of ideas about how to celebrate Christmas, aren't there? In fact, Amazon has a lot of ideas about how you ought to sell Christmas, don't they? <laughs> the Aventura Mall has a lot of ideas about how you ought to celebrate Christmas. Apple and um, any other myriad of Samsung um, and various other groups have ideas. Mercedes-Benz, you know, you see their, their advertising. All these people have ideas about how you ought to celebrate Christmas. It's a big question, and it mandates, it, it, it is worthy of our asking that question because of a couple of things. Number one, because it is such an important thing. When we look at the incarnation, when we look at God coming to the earth, this is a, a monumental event that we really ought to look at and we ought to consider how we celebrate this. But secondly, we ought to do so because we ought to ask ourselves this question and we ought to study this because so many people obviously do it wrong. We need, to, we need to be aware of that. We need to be aware that throughout not only South Florida and throughout America, but around the world, if they celebrate Christmas, Christmas at all, there are many, in fact, the masses ignore the true meaning of Christmas. And instead of Christmas being about God made flesh, it's about Santa coming down a chimney or it's about what you're going to get as opposed to what has been given. And so, because of that, it, it's just a good thing for Christians in this present day and time to take a wonderful, beautiful, careful look at the beautiful story of what God has done and how he has done it in order that we would not repeat um, the things that are uh, missteps in, in worshiping um, at Christmas time. You know, there's, uh, we, we didn't mention the fact that there's a lot of football games. Some people, when they think of Christmas, they think of football. Some people, when they think of Christmas, they think of family coming together, and that's a very happy thing for some people, and that's a very sad thing for other people. I mean, we can be honest about that. Um, each year, I hear of, of great stories of gladness as families get together, and each year I hear of great stories of trouble and tribulation and difficulty as families come together. Um, for some people, they celebrate Christmas by getting drunk or getting high. 
this is the way that they um, have been taught. This is the way that, you know, there's a little bit of time off. And so, as opposed to looking at the tremendous significance of God becoming a human to die for our sins, um, it's, a, it's a time of just real um, self-fulfillment um, um, for many. So it's, a, it's an appropriate thing that we would look carefully at how to celebrate the joy of Christmas. Um, if you would, notice on your outline there the passage of Scripture that is here. And we're going to read verses 8 through 20, but we're really going to take most of our message from the last four verses of 17 through 20. But let's read 8 through 20. I want you to notice this with me and see this beautiful image. I have stood in um, a pasture land outside of Bethlehem before. I've been to the Holy Lands a few times. And uh, I've stood, you know, Bethlehem is just a couple of miles from Jerusalem, and uh, it's hill country that's out there. And even today, um, you can see uh, goats and sheep feeding um, in open fields outside of Bethlehem. And so um, that's even still the case today. And notice here with me in verse 8, we see a scene from 2,000 years ago. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. Verse 10. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you what? Good news of great what? Can you circle great joy? Today is the Advent day of joy. Um, Each Advent Sunday we represent, we recognize a certain truth of Christmas. And today it is joy. So the angel says, fear not, behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David who is Christ, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. So he told them, this is how you're going to know who it is. Here's the sign. You shall find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Verse 13. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts. By the way, that's a war term heavenly warriors, praising God and saying, let's read out loud together verse 14, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. That was very weak. Let's act like the angels for just a moment. Lift up your voice, clear your throat. Everybody, you ready? Let's read verse 14 as if you're one of those angels. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. A beautiful statement. The angels, they burst through the realm in the sky, out of heaven into the earthly realm, and they're giving praise and honor and glory to God. They're so excited. They're so filled with joy. It is their great joy to proclaim this. Think about that. Verse 15, when the angels went away from them in heaven, the, heaven the, angels, the shepherds said to one another, let us go to Bethlehem to see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. Verse 16, and they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. 17, and when they saw it, they made known the same which had been told to them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. Verse 20, and the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had seen, all that they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Now, it's very interesting as we look at Christmas and we look at this beautiful story that there is so much reason not to skip this. There is so much reason not to ignore this. Let me tell you that this, this is so worthy of our focus at this time of the year. 
what God was doing, what God was setting in motion, the salvation of his people. This is so worthy that Christians would become familiar with every nuance of the story, the story that perhaps you've heard all your life, the passages from Isaiah, the passages from Matthew, the passages from Luke, that every year that you have heard messages on them, if you've been a church-going person, it is worthy that we would see every nuance. Let me tell you that this year I have had a strange thing happen as we've been coming up on Christmas. Um, this week you're going to receive a letter from me. And the opening paragraph, I'll just kind of tell you what it, the idea of it. And I want you to read it carefully when you see it. But it's, it's just amazing. You know, this fall has been a hard fall for us. It's been a hard fall for South Florida. It's been a hard fall for the people of South Texas. It's been a hard fall for the people in the Caribbean, namely Cuba and Puerto Rico. It's been a hard time. Um, there's been a lot of stress. And then you add on top of that the fact that there's been some things culturally and politically that have gone on that have stressed us out. And this coming after last year's stress of the election. I mean, there are things that just culturally, widely, or even things more narrowly, that for the Christian community that have greatly concerned us, these have, been, these have been trying days. And even though the economy has been getting a lot better um, pretty fast, there's, there's still been the hurricane dig out and some other things that have been there. These have been, these have been difficult days. There's, there's been rare times in my life that I have looked more forward to just savoring the fact that a Savior came to save us from all of this. The fact that Jesus came to save us out of a fallen world of storms and stresses and fierce conflicts and disappointments and frustrations. The fact that Jesus came to save us out of the cancers and the car wrecks of life. Jesus came to set it all right. And so as he does that, Christians, God's people, can look at the truth of, Christi of Christmas and savor it and celebrate the joy of it, knowing that it takes us beyond the current stresses and the current crises that we often have. Why Christmas? Um, I want to, why the word Christmas? Where did this come from? I want to remind you, literally, it means Christ's mass. Christ's mass. That's what it means. Christmas means Christ's mass. And ma mass is a, is a time when the people all come together to celebrate and worship. And so this is a time when we, when we come together for that it is a festival time devoted to that. We first see this word in Old English written down. The first recording of it is in 1038. So um, we're talking nearly a thousand years ago. Um, we see the first time that this word Christmas is used uh, in English anyway. Um, but why December the 25th? Um, people have often said, well, Jesus was not born on December 25th. And I'm like, well, it's very unlikely that he was not born on December 25th. He may have been, but we don't know what the actual date was. Why would we, where did that come to be? Why was December 25th selected? Notice I've given you a few things here. The early church established it on this calendar day in the 4th century. We do know that. So early church, this is in the first couple of centuries, first three centuries of the church. We, we call it the fourth century, which was around the year between 300 and 325. We, we, we have some documents from then that recognize that Christians started widely celebrating it. We weren't sure exactly when those documents were, were written, but they're around, the historical documents written around 300 to 325. So early on, this is a long time ago. We're talking 1,600, 1,700 years ago, Christians began celebrating Christmas on December the 25th. Why? Why would we do that? 
Well, it was, we do know that December 25th is when the Roman Empire celebrated winter solstice. Now, the actual solstice is on the 22nd, but for whatever reasons, they celebrated it on the 25th. Notice here as well, another reason it could have been is that to counteract the numerous pagan end-of-the-year festivals in Roman culture. Perhaps that is why the church gravitated toward December the 25th. There were so many other pagan things going on in the culture that they're, that they're like, well, maybe, you know, maybe it's a few things coming together here, including the last one that is here. This is approximately nine months after the, the Annunciation Festival, which is the celebration of the Holy Spirit causing Mary to conceive. And so it would make sense um, that, that since that, the, the issue of the Annunciation Festival would, would come about in Christian culture first, um, that perhaps it was a projection of nine months out. Those things together, however it came to be, that it was around, um, you know, we're talking 1,200, I mean, excuse me, um, 1,700 years ago that we had begun recognizing Christ's birth at December 25th. Well, as we look at that, we recognize, okay, this is a tradition. This is a tradition, and people celebrate it around the world, Christians celebrate it around the world. How should we celebrate it? We ought to ask that question. Of course, there's fun traditions, and there's other traditions. Perhaps some of them can go from fun into distraction. Um, we recognize that. So there's a lot of things that could be said about it, as we've recognized, but how should we celebrate Christmas? I want to say to you, first and foremost, the very first thing that we should do is recognize on the bottom of the sheet there, number one, if you haven't already, you should become a Christian to celebrate Christmas. This is the greatest way. If you have never become a Christian, let me tell you that the greatest way that you can celebrate Christmas is to embrace Christ. Maybe some of you have been coming to church. Maybe some of you have even grown up in church, but you would say, I know that I am not a Christian. I know that my heart has never been truly surrendered to Christ and that Christ has not called me to himself, that I have not responded to him or perhaps he's been calling and I have, I have resisted him. Let me just tell you that I invite you to celebrate Christ at Christmas by surrendering your heart to Christ, receiving the gift that God has given, believing in him. Now notice this, and you can fill this in on your outline. Receive the gift from God of himself to you. That's what Christmas is, God giving his son. For God so loved the world that he gave, that at the right time Christ came and was born into the world. Look at the next part there. Jesus was born to die. Let's say that out loud as you fill it in. Jesus was born to die. He was born to die, and why? So that you can live. And he says, as many as receive me, to them he will give the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Now, I want you to notice the words of this great carol. And I'm going to ask if eventually we can sing this one Pastor Lucas and Pastor Ben, but notice this. I love these words. Let's read it out loud together. Good Christian men rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Now ye need not fear the grave. Jesus Christ was calls you one and calls you all to gain his everlasting hall. Christ was born to save Christ was born to save. Look at those words. They're on your outline there. He says that the words of that hymn say, good Christian men do what? Rejoice. There's good, this is good news of great joy. This is why we have an Advent word of joy. There, there's rescue that is here. This is so much better than Santa. <laughs> You know, Santa doesn't offer you to hop into a sleigh and ride off into eternity of hot chocolate and gifts and everything else at the North Pole. I mean, he's not, he's not offering to take you out of this. Jesus is saying, come to me, come into the ark of my love, and I will save you from the consequences and from the wrath of your sin. Notice here with me that we are called to believe him to receive him, 
to turn away from sin and self. The greatest way that you can celebrate Christmas is to believe him, to receive him, to turn away. That means to repent from sin and self. So if you don't know that you know that you know that Jesus came and was born for you and died for you and rose again for you, this morning I want to encourage you not to leave this place without saying, Lord Jesus, I recognize that I am a sinner and that you're a savior. I receive you as my Lord and Savior today. I believe that you are who you say you are and that you have come for me. I want to encourage you to turn your heart to Christ. But there's some other things that if that has already happened in your life as a Christian, as a Christian that you should do. So the Christians in this room, or maybe even right now as you've received Christ, even as I'm preaching, um, which is completely possible, I would encourage you, this is how we can celebrate Christmas. And I want us to notice it from 17, verses 17 through 20. So the shepherds were out in the flock. They were out there. The angels come. They declare the tremendous news that a Savior has been born for you. You're going to go into Bethlehem. You're going to see him wrapped in, in uh, special claws. And of all things, think about this, not in the end, not in the Holiday Inn of Bethlehem, but in the stable outside the Holiday Inn of Bethlehem, in a feeding trough, you're going to find a baby. Now, it's a sign because that just doesn't happen. You don't lay babies, even back then, you don't lay babies in horses' stalls or in cattle stalls. You don't lay them in a feeding trough. This was a sign for them. It is showing the shepherds who it is. It is showing the humility of God in this. It is showing the nature of the incarnation that God leaves the halls of heaven, his everlasting hall, and comes to earth, and he doesn't come to a palace, but he comes to a stable. And this is astounding, that not even humans typically would do this, would do this, this is, an, this is a, a great sign that that's what is here. So that has happened. The shepherds come, they worship, and in verse 17, look what it says, what they do. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. Verse 18. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up the, all these things, pondering them in her heart, and look what the shepherds did. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. I want us to see four things that we should do at Christmas, much like these who are here. The first one is the good news. The good news. Tell others about it. Fill that in, all caps, good news. It is good news. The gospel is not bad news. The good news is excuse me, the gospel is good news for those who are perishing and being saved. It is the news that you don't have to stay in your sin. You don't have to remain in bondage to alcohol. You don't have to remain in bondage to your, to your selfishness, in bondage to the cocaine, in bondage to the anger, in bondage to the past, in bondage, in bondage, in bondage. Jesus comes to set us free. And this is the beautiful picture of the transformed life, the transformation that the Savior offers to those who believe in him. That he converts them to righteousness. He converts them, warts and all, into his goodness. He converts them not because of any goodness on their own, but because of his goodness, he comes and he redeems us, he saves us from the fallen world that we're in. This is good news that needs to be told. I, I want you to see this. The angel said to them, and this is back in verse 10, but it says, the angel said to them, fear not, for I have good news of great joy that will be for who? All people. I love this. You see, news is for everyone. If it's news, it's for everyone. It's public. It's intended to be what? Repeated. And so that is one of the things that Christians should do. This is what the shepherds did. They came, they heard the news, and they repeated it. 
And this is what Christians are called to do. In fact, Jesus, before he left, 33 years later, would say, go and tell. Go and tell the world. That's the reason that we just saw a video about the Lottie Moon Christmas offering in the International Mission Board. What are those 3,500 missionaries that we support doing? They're out there telling everyone that God became a man, and he died for our sins, and he rose again, overcoming our sin. And if you will believe that, you can be free. You see, there's there's good news that is being told, and we are called to tell it. How strange when people hear really good news and they keep it to themselves. That that, that doesn't, doesn't make sense. When you have good news, it is, it is natural that we would share it and proclaim it. Look at letter B there. The shepherds, after they saw it, went about telling what happened. We see that in verse 17. Look at verse 17 at the top of your page. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. They made known the saying. Do you see that? That's, that's right out of the text. That's what they did. They did exactly what the angels told them to do. Now, what exactly had they been told? This is good news and great joy. A Savior is born for you. And so the message of the shepherds was that just that, now think about this, we could miss this. Was it just that, wow, we were out in the field and this blinding light came, scared us to death, and then he said, fear not, for I bring you good tidings and great joy, and you're going to go into the town and you are going to see a baby wrapped in swallowing cloths, and that's the sign. Is that what, the, and then we went in there and we saw it. Is that the good news? No, the good news comes, you, we, we skipped over it. The good news is a Savior has been born for you, who is Christ the Lord. And so the sign of the manger, the sign of the swaddling cloth, that a baby is laid in a strange place like a cow saw, that's just a sign that what you're hearing is true. That the angels declare a Savior has been born. This is the amazing truth that the shepherds were proclaiming. That the Savior has come. The Savior has come. This is what happened. This is how we know. The Savior has come. Notice this. The miraculous, humble baby message has purpose. The miraculous, humble baby message has purpose. He is the Savior. He's the Christ, which literally means anointed one. You see, Joseph was told the same thing in, first Matthew, in Matthew chapter 1. Uh, Joseph was told this in verse 21. You know, he, the angel comes to him, or excuse me, not the angel, the Lord comes to Joseph and says to him, Joseph, Mary is with child. Don't divorce her. Don't put her away. She hasn't been unfaithful to you. Listen to me. Joseph, this one that she is with child, notice what it says here in verse 21. She, Mary, will bear a son, and you shall call his name, what? Jesus. Why? For he will save his people from their sins. Now, that's a strange sentence if you don't look at the construction of it. You're going to call him Jesus. It doesn't say, and he will save his people from their sins, but it says for. Circle the word for on your outline. And the reason it says for he will save his people from his sins has to do with what the name Yeshua means or Jesus means. Jesus is the Greek pronunciation of a Hebrew idea of Yeshua. Um, But notice this with me, that Yeshua means God is salvation or Yahweh saves, Yah saves, but God is salvation. The very name Jesus means salvation, and that it's God who saves. So his name is his function. We see that here, that we gain much to see that, and that is coming all the way back to the Lord appearing to Joseph, to the angels appearing to the shepherds. This message, this story, this account shows us the tremendous value of Christmas. Now think about this with me. We've said it's all about good news and telling others about it. Now that last statement that I want you to see there is the poor shepherds, and by the way, shepherds were typically poor. 
Um, they weren't the wealthy people um, who stayed in the big houses. I mean, these were shepherds that were on night duty. So this may have been the poorest of the poor shepherds, right? These are the ones that had to stay out there. These aren't the guys who pro probably owned the flocks very much, but they were the hired hands that are out there spending the night in the field. Who wants to do that? Perhaps a cold night, perhaps a hot night, whatever. They're out there in the field all night looking at a bunch of sheep. Now notice this. The poor shepherds had the news and they shared it in their day. Now, that's, that's pretty amazing. That the gospel is first announced to poor shepherds and we don't even know their names. That shows God's humility and God's love for everyone. He starts off with the poorest in the crowd, and he says, you get to go tell what I've said. You get to go bless Joseph and Mary, showing up and saying, this is what happened, and would be a tremendous blessing to Joseph and Mary, affirming what they have been through. Notice here with me, Revelation 22, verse 17, right at the end of the Bible, it says, let him who hears say, come. Now, that's kind of amazing. Have you heard the gospel? If you have heard the gospel, if you have received the gospel, you have been given the task to go tell others, come. That's this picture. Let him who hears the gospel say to others, come. Everyone, come. Whoever is willing, come. That's what it's all about, that we would live here in this life, faithful to the Lord Jesus, telling others about what he has done. So the good news is, how should we celebrate Christmas? I believe that we need to tell others about what it means. Now, you know what? You can do this in the simplest of ways. I do it all the time. And, I, and I, I enjoy Christmas. If you're standing there filling up the car or you're sitting there in the doctor's office or you're, you're somewhere, and it's, you know, don't force things and, and be all odd for God and things, as, as Pastor Ben said last week. You, know, you, don't, you don't have to force things, but God, if you will pray that God will open the door, he will give you opportunities. And as you are given the opportunity, you know, somebody says, yeah, Christmas is so busy and everything else. You know, you can say, yeah, I've, I've come to realize I really love Christmas. Oh, yeah, me too. Why do you like Christmas? Well, I like Christmas. Because, well, I love Christmas because it just reminds me of God's tremendous love for us. That he, the creator of the world, will become one of us. That little baby in the manger, that was God. Born into the flesh, he's going to grow up to die and die for our sins. You know, it's just very, very simple. You can, and there is, there is no way of telling how God is moving in that person's life and the people that are around you. You can speak the gospel as we come up on Christmas. It is a natural time to do it. It's a very natural time to, to invite people to come to the Lord. Look at the third one that is here. It's by amazement. We should celebrate Christmas, I believe, with amazement, um, with worship, with wonder at Christmas. We can wonder at it. And I want you to see the passage of Scripture. It's verse 18. Look at verse 18. And all who heard it wondered, circle the word wondered at the top of your outline there in that page in verse 18. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. I mean, they're... The, the idea of wonder is to be in awe, to be in an in a investigative, uh, intriguing, interested wonder, to be rather amazed by it. And I, I, I want you to see this here. I, I think it's good for us to ask this key question. Notice this question, and, and Cheryl and I, my daughter, were talking about this last night. I want you to consider this question that I've written on the outline. What's more amazing, that God could create the world or that he would become a man? Kind of think about this question. What's more amazing, that God could create all of this or that he would become a man? Now, this is kind of a, a deep question because if you think about it, if you really look, at everything that we know about existence, everything that we know in science, everything that we know in psychology, everything that we know about history, everything that we know, listen to this, about biology and physics and astrophysics. If you look through a microscope or you look through a telescope at the universe, 
If you look through an electron microscope that looks at the, at the atomic level and you read about what is being discovered day after day after day, that the, the amount and the depth of this universe that is there, it's truly amazing, if you think about it, that God could create all of this. That's an amazing thought, that every molecule that whizzes around inside of an atom, and every, every, every part of an atom that, that comes together and holds together, that God created this, and he designed it, and, and all that we see that is around us, that, that is an amazing thing. But to me, it's even more amazing that a God who could do that would become part of his creation. A God who could make all of that and know all of that would subject himself to becoming a human? And think about this with me. Not just become a human, but he would not be born in the most esteemed nation on the planet when he was born? I mean, certainly he would be born in Rome. Or certainly he would be born at a later time in Washington, D.C., or in London. Certainly he would come to the power center of the world if he was God. But that's not what he did. He was born to a, a little nation of people that the warring, controlling civilizations didn't have much use for. And so not only would he come to humanity at all, but he would be born to a non-esteemed nation. And was he born in a palace? No. He's born in a cattle stall. I mean, this is getting more and more amazing as we go. And then, when you look at the whole story and you look at the whole thing as it fits together, it's, it's not even with proper parents. I mean, he's born, and right off the bat, Anyone who really kind of knows the family says, yeah, mm -hmm, oops. They didn't, they didn't get married yet. So in the world's eyes, this is an illegitimate baby. We, we start to see the, the extreme humility that God displays, not only in creating the world, but then becoming and joining the world and then we're not even talking about yet of how the world would reject him and how the world would lay him down on a cross and drive nails through his feet and through his hands and thrust a spear into his side and say, look, we did it. Friends, we can be truly amazed at the incarnation. We should be amazed. It should, fill this in, it should stretch your mind when you really think about Christmas. Please don't be moving so fast right now that you're worried about the next deal, the next meal, the next party, the next deal that you're going to get, the next gift that's coming up. That you miss the stretching of this. Sit or, I encourage you, sit around and think and talk about the incarnation. I have to confess to you, as a kid growing up, even in this church, with my wonderful mom and dad, I, I can't tell you that as a child, I, really, I was really challenged to deeply think about the incarnation. I can't tell you that the incarnation trumped all of the gifts and the candy canes and all of the stories. I think those things trumped the big picture most of the time. And I, I, I just, I think that Christians need to pay attention to this. We need to be careful how we celebrate this. You see, notice this. We should be concerned about spoiling Christmas for our children. Now, there's a trick here in the way I'm saying this. Usually when you talk about spoiling Christmas, you're talking about letting out what they're going to get, right? Well, that is not the concern that we need to have. 
The greater concern that we need to have is that we would spoil the beauty of the incarnation with self-serving, self appeasing self-gratifying focus. As a church and as individuals, as Christians, we should come with joy to see the beauty and the joy of Christmas. Notice this. If our children are more amazed by presence than the Savior, you have a problem. If your children are more amazed by presence than the Savior, I think you have a problem. I think your kids could miss the gospel in your home. I think, I think you say, well, what do we do about that? How do we overcome this? Oh, well, listen, we're, we're trying to help you with that. In fact, notice this with me. This is why Advent traditions are really important. This is why we encourage you to get the devotionals out of the bookstore. This is why we encourage you to have time around the table in the evening or time before they go to bed where you're really talking. And I'm not talking where you're so tired and they're falling asleep and you're falling asleep and everything else. I'm talking take the time to teach them the truth. Take the time to do whatever it takes. Take special moments away to go and to see. You can go look at the light. You can go find a manger somewhere, and you can go look at that. You can talk about your traditions in your home. I I can tell you that one of the things that Marcy and I have done from early on, every Christmas ornament on our tree has to do with the incarnation. The Christmas tree ornaments on our tree. There's manger scenes, and there's statements, and there's things that are here, and they're beautiful, and they're real, and they're rich, but we just wanted it to be all about Jesus. We need to be careful that we don't spoil Christmas for our kids. Um, I, I just want to encourage you, there's, there's all kinds of different resources that are available to help you in your conversations at home. Um, So, number two is the good news. Tell others about it. Number three, amazement. And we see in verse 19, number four, adoration. I want you to see adoration. How should we worship at Christmas? It's by deeply considering and appreciating Christmas. Deeply consider it. Deeply think about it. Deeply appreciate it. This is beyond amazement. Amazement is doing that, but this is going beyond that. And where do we see it? We see it in Mary's response. Look at on the screen in front of you or in the box at the top of the page. Mary's response was this. But Mary, so other people were wondering about it, but Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them where? In her heart. This is down in her being. This is down in who she is. Mary is listening to this. I mean, think about it. They've been through a hard time. She's just given birth. It's amazing how all these pictures of so many Mary, you know, it doesn't look like a young lady that just gave birth. Um, she's looking all fresh and happy and everything else, you know. Um, but, you know, here, Mary's just given birth, and she's there, and they've laid Jesus in the manger, and they're just thinking, I guess this is the, the best that we have going for us right now. At least we're not out in the street. And then these shepherds came up, and they go, you're not going to believe what just happened out in the fields. We're glad we found you. This is just like we heard. And, and she's, you know, I would imagine she and Joseph are saying, what do you mean? And they said, you didn't see the light in the sky? We saw the light. It was unbelievable. We thought we were dead. And then he said, don't be afraid. This is what's happened. The Savior is born. A Savior that the world's been waiting for is born. And this is how you're going to find him. We come in here and we see you. And this, it's all real. And can you imagine Mary sitting there going, okay. So I wasn't going crazy when I had that dream. That, that really did happen. And Joseph is saying, I'm glad I didn't put her away. I'm glad I listened to the Lord when he came and he showed me. Because here is another miracle, another sign. It wasn't just a sign for the shepherds, but perhaps it was also a sign for Joseph and Mary. You see, God is just so good. He comes and he works in our hearts and our lives. And he comes and he ministers to us in our trouble. And sometimes when he calls you to do a hard thing, like have a baby out of wedlock saying that it came from the Holy Spirit, he comes and he says, it's going to be okay. I'm going to confirm that I'm with you all along the way. It's going to be okay. Notice here with me on the outline that number two, allow true Christmas, Christmas, to fill your heart. Because that's what we see, that's exactly what we see Mary doing. 
Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. Now, this means that we need to be still and deeply consider its meaning. We need to really think about the meaning of Christmas. There's so much to see, and there's so much to enjoy. You see, our hearts, and we can see this from the statement in verse 19, our hearts are closely related, related to our treasure. In fact, Jesus would say this very clearly later in his ministry. He would say, for where your treasure is, there where what? Your heart be also. And so met, here, here we see treasure and heart, treasure and heart, treasure and heart. Mary is treasuring these things in her heart. She's treasuring God's affirmation. She's treasuring that this is the Savior born to the world. She's treasuring that though I have not understood all that's happening, my soul magnifies the Lord. Now here it's nine months later, the baby is born, and there's another affirmation that this is right on track. She's treasuring this in her heart. Do you treasure when God brings you his grace, and his affirmations. You see, fill this in, the affections of Marcy's, Marcy's, well, I hope Marcy too. <laughs> the affections of Mary's heart were touched by Christmas. The affections, the things that she treasured, that's affections, the things you treasure. The affections of her heart was was built up and they were touched by this Christ story coming th through her life. My question is, are your affections touched by Christmas? Does Christmas matter that much to you? Does the fact that God would leave the halls of heaven, is that what you meditate on at Christmas? I hope and pray that it does and that your heart is touched by that. You see, our heart meditations can be right or they can be what? Wrong. Your heart can meditate on the wrong things. Your heart can be misguided. Your heart can miss the message. And I want you to see Matthew or Psalm 19, verse 14. It's on the screen in front of you. Look right up there on the screen. It says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. What this means is it might not be acceptable. This is a request. This is a prayer. Lord, let my heart meditate on the right things. And then we see down in Psalm 104, verse 34, something similar. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. May we make that our prayer. Lord, may my heart meditate on the right things at Christmas, not the wrong things at Christmas. And, and it's right that we focus on this a good deal because, folks, the messages are powerful from the world. They're very powerful. I mean, the advertising works. The culture around us is really focused on other things. We, we need to remember the big picture spiritually, and we need to remember the big picture devotionally to the Lord. So what do the meditations of your heart look like at Christmas? Some of you would say, to be honest with you, I'm so busy, I don't know that my heart meditates on anything. Well, you can solve that. It may take a little bit of discipline, and it makes, may take some decisions, but you can solve that. You can decide, I'm going to take this portion of time and set it aside to spend with the Lord. Maybe it's after you get home from work. Maybe it's while the kids are taking a nap. Maybe it's, you say, well, they don't take a nap. They seem to be on, I don't know what. Um, and they are, well, maybe you could be like Susanna Wesley and just take your dress and hold it up over your head. She would take her apron and she would put it up over her head and sit in the corner of their little house. And she had 11 children running around the house. And they said, when mom's got her apron up over her head, leave her alone. <laughs> She's spending time with God. You know, I don't know what you're going to have to do. But you and I need to take time to meditate on the right things. 
And if you will do that, and if fathers and mothers, if you will lead your family to do that, Christmas will have all of God's joy and meaning that it should have. What do the meditations of your heart look like? The last one I want you to see very quickly as we go. And number five is praise and glory. Worship God with adoration at Christmas. Worship, just worship God with absolute adoration at what he has done. This is what the shepherds did. And we see it in verse 20. It's the last part. Look what it says in verse 20. In fact, if you would, just read verse 20 out loud with me. It's on the screen in front of you or in the box on your page, whichever is easier for you. Let's read verse 20. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Circle those words on your outline, glorifying and praising God. That's what they were doing. They came out of this whole thing rejoicing in what they had seen and heard. They heard a message that nearly scared them to death. They went and they obeyed. And they went and they told others. They find Jesus and Mary and the baby there. And they come away from there, heading back to the sheep that were probably left by themselves out in the field. I don't know how it went for them. But they came back praising and rejoicing in God. Now, would those, those men later come to faith in Christ? I would imagine God in his goodness perhaps brought some of them to true faith in the Lord Jesus Christ by the time... Um, that the ministry was all over of Jesus' work 30 years later. When we get to heaven, we'll be able to ask all those questions. Hey, were you one of the shepherds? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I look forward to those. That's part of what I mean by meditating, considering, and just exalting in the story that has been given. But notice this, fill this in. Allow Christmas to lift your heart and voice. Allow it to lift your heart and voice. Whether by impulse, just because it comes naturally, or whether by will, because you have to work at it, lift your voice to God like the shepherds did. Some of you, this is a hard time for you. You've lost a loved one, and this is going to be a difficult Christmas for you. Some of you, your family disagrees about other things, and there's strife in your family, and you're you're tempted to look at all of the struggles. Some of you are struggling financially. Some of you are struggling with your career. Some of you are struggling with great health problems. Some of you are in physical pain. But I want to encourage you to look at the message of Christmas and the big picture. Just hold on to the big picture amidst your grief or amidst your concerns and praise and worship God, whether by impulse or whether by an act of the will. And God will reward and rejoice in your heart. He does that. Matthew, excuse me, in Hebrews eleven six, it says, for the Lord is a rewarder of those who seek him. Fill this in. Don't miss the personal nature of loving and exalting God. Don't think, well, I'm just going to go to the church and we're going to do it at the church. We're going to sing the carols at the church. No, do it personally while you're at church. But do it personally while you're at home. Do it personally while you're in the car. Do it personally when you're with your family. Don't miss the personal nature of loving and exalting God. Here's a question. Are you either too cool or too private or too mature or too sophisticated to worship? Don't be too cool. To worship. Don't be too sophisticated to praise God. Don't be too filled with the concerns and the cares of this world to give time to worship God. Don't, don't let anything get in the way of your worship. Look at this. By the power of His grace, God can transform your heart. Will you let Him? That's the reason that he came to the earth. He came to transform us. He came to change us, to convert us to his grace that we would walk in his ways. Now, look at the screen if you would. There's two questions. Uh, We've asked, how should we celebrate Christmas? Um, There's a lot of different ways that people celebrate Christmas. We've asked, how should we celebrate 
break Christmas, and I've tried to answer that for Christians. But here's the last question for you. So how will you celebrate Christmas? I'm going to ask if you would to simply close everything you have, and nobody's going to move just yet. We're going to take a couple of minutes in the busyness of this present life to be still. I ask if you would to bow your head and your heart and think about that question. What are you going to do with what you've heard today? For some of you who maybe need to give your life to Christ, I hope that you'll celebrate Christmas by becoming a Christian. And I hope that you'll come talk to me afterwards and say, I'm one of those, I need to do that. Come to one of our pastors. Or maybe you need to just say, I'm a Christian. And I don't want Christmas to get by me. And I'm going to be careful to pay attention to what this message has challenged me with. And maybe you need to make some specific commitments right now to the Lord and to yourself that you're going to act on what you've heard. So let's just be quiet for just a moment, and then eventually we'll sing.